following are my opinions and do not reflect the opinions or policies of any particular prosecutor's office. <laughs> I am a prosecutor. I believe in law and order. I'm the adopted son of a police officer, a Marine, and a hairdresser. I believe in accountability and that we should all be safe in our communities. I love my job and the people that do it. I just think that it's our responsibility to do it better. By a show of hands, how many of you by the age of 25 had either acted up in school, went somewhere you're specifically told to stay out of, or drank alcohol before your legal age? All right. How many of you shoplifted, tried an illegal drug, or got into a physical fight, yes, even with a sibling? Now, how many of you ever spent one day in jail for any of those decisions? How many of you sitting here today think that you are a danger to society or should be defined by those actions of youthful indiscretion? Point, point taken. When we talk about criminal justice reform, we often focus on, on a few things, and, that, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. But first, I'm going to, since you shared with me, I'm going to give you a confession on my part. I went to law school to make money. I had no interest in being a public servant. I had no interest in the criminal law, and I definitely didn't think that I would ever be a prosecutor. But near the end of my first year of law school, I got an internship in the Roxbury Division of the Boston Municipal Court. I knew of Roxbury as an impoverished neighborhood in Boston plagued by gun violence and drug crime. My life in my legal career changed the first day of that internship. I walked into a courtroom and I saw an auditorium of people who one by one would approach the front of that courtroom to say two words and two words only, not guilty. They were predominantly black and brown. And then a judge, a defense attorney, and a prosecutor would make life-altering decisions about that person without their input. They were predominantly white. As each person, one by one, approached the front of that courtroom, I couldn't stop but think, how did they get here? I wanted to know their stories. And as the prosecutor read the facts of each case, I was thinking to myself, we could have predicted that. That seems so preventable. Not because I was an expert in criminal law, but because it was common sense. Over the course of the internship, I began to recognize people in the auditorium, not because they were criminal masterminds, but because they were coming to us for help and we were sending them out without any. My second year of law school, I worked as a paralegal for a defense attorney, and in that experience, I met many young men accused of murder. Even in our worst, I saw human stories. And they all contained childhood trauma, victimization, poverty, loss, disengagement from school, early interaction with the police and the criminal justice system, all leading to a seat in a courtroom. Those convicted of murder were condemned to die in prison, and it was during those meetings with those men that I couldn't fathom why we would spend so much money to keep this one person in jail for the next 80 years when we could have reinvested it up front and perhaps prevented the whole thing from happening in the first place. My third year of law school, I defended people accused of small street crimes, mostly mentally ill, mostly homeless, mostly drug addicted, all in need of help. They would come to us, and we would send them away without that help. They were in need of our assistance, but we weren't giving them any. Prosecuted, adjudged, and defended by people who knew nothing about them. The staggering inefficiency is what drove me to criminal justice work. The unfairness of it all made me want to be a defender. The power dynamic that I came to understand made me become a prosecutor. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about the problem. We know that the criminal justice system needs reform. We know that there are 2.3 million people in American jails and prisons, making us the most incarcerated nation on the planet.
We know that there's another 7 million people on probation or parole. We know that the criminal justice system disproportionately affects people of color, particularly poor people of color. And we know that there are system failures happening everywhere that bring people to our courtrooms, but what we do not discuss is how ill-equipped our prosecutors are to receive them. When we talk about criminal justice reform, we as a society focus on three things. We complain, we tweet, we protest about the police, about sentencing laws, about prison. We rarely, if ever, talk about the prosecutor. In the fall of 2009, a young man was arrested by the Boston Police Department. He was 18 years old, he was African American, and he was a senior at a local public school. He had his sights set on college, but his part-time minimum wage job wasn't providing the financial opportunity he needed to enroll in school. In a series of bad decisions, he stole 30 laptops from the store and sold them on the internet. This led to his arrest and a criminal complaint of 30 felony charges. The potential jail time he faced is what stressed Christopher out the most, but what he had little understanding of was the impact a criminal record would have on his future. I was standing in arraignments that day when Christopher's case came across my desk, and at the risk of sounding dramatic in that moment, I had Christopher's life in my hands. I was 29 years old, a brand new prosecutor, and I had little appreciation for the decisions that I would make would impact Christopher's life. Christopher's case was a serious one and needed to be dealt with as such, but I didn't think that branding him a felon for the rest of his life was the right answer. For the most part, prosecutors step onto the job with little appreciation of the impact of our decisions, regardless of our intent. Despite our broad discretion, we learn to avoid risk at all costs, rendering our discretion basically useless. History has conditioned us to believe that somehow the criminal justice system brings about accountability and improves public safety despite evidence to the contrary. We're judged internally and externally by our convictions and our trial wins, so prosecutors aren't really incentivized to be creative in our case positions, dispositions or to take risks on people we might not otherwise. We stick to an outdated method, counterproductive to achieving the very goal that we all want, and that's safer communities. Yet most prosecutors standing in my space would have arraigned Christopher. They have little appreciation for what we can do. Arraigning Christopher would give him a criminal record, making it harder for him to get a job, setting in motion a cycle that defines the failing criminal justice system today. With a criminal record and without a job, Christopher would be able, unable to find employment, education, or stable housing. Without those protective factors in his life, Christopher would be more likely to commit further more serious crime. The more contact Christopher had with the criminal justice system, the more likely it would be that he would return again and again and again, all at tremendous social cost to his children, to his family, and to his peers. And ladies and gentlemen, it is a terrible public safety outcome for the rest of us. When I came out of law school, I did the same thing as everybody else. I came out as a prosecutor, expected to do justice, but I never learned what justice was in my classes. None of us do. None of us do. And yet, prosecutors are the most powerful actors in the criminal justice system. Our power is virtually boundless. In most cases, not the judge, not the police, not the legislature, not the mayor, not the governor, not the president can tell us how to prosecute our cases. The decision to arraign Christopher and give him a criminal record was exclusively mine. I would choose whether to prosecute him for 30 felonies, for one felony, for a misdemeanor, or at all. I would choose whether to leverage Christopher into a plea deal or to take the case to trial, and ultimately, I'd be in a position to ask for Christopher to go to jail. These are decisions that prosecutors make every day unfettered, and we are unaware and untrained of the grave consequences of those decisions. One night this past summer, I was at a, a small gathering of professional men of color from around the city, and as I stood there stuffing free finger sandwiches into my mouth, as you do as a public servant, I noticed <laughs> across the room a young man waving and smiling at me and approaching me. And I, I recognized him, but I, I couldn't place from where. And before I knew it, this young man was hugging me and thanking me. 
you cared about me and you changed my life. It was Christopher. See, I never arraigned Christopher. He never faced a judge or a jail. He never had a criminal record. Instead, I worked with Christopher, first on being accountable for his actions, and then putting him in a position where he wouldn't reoffend. We recovered 75% of the computers that he sold and gave them back to Best Buy and came up with a financial plan to repay for the computers we couldn't recover. Christopher did community service. He wrote an essay reflecting on how this case could impact his future and that of the community. He applied to college, he obtained financial aid, and he went on to graduate from a four-year school. After we... After we finished hugging, I looked at his name tag to learn that Christopher was a manager of a large bank in Boston. Christopher had accomplished all, making a lot more money than me. <laughs> Christopher had accomplished all of this in the six years since I had first seen him in Roxbury Court. I can't take credit for Christopher's journey to success, but I certainly did my part to keep him on the path. There are thousands of Christophers out there. Some locked in our jails and prisons. We need thousands of prosecutors to recognize that and to protect them. An employed Christopher is better for public safety than a condemned one. It's a bigger win for all of us. In retrospect, the decision not to throw the book at Christopher makes perfect sense. When I saw him that first day in Roxbury Court, I didn't see a criminal standing there. I saw myself, a young person in need of intervention. As an individual caught selling a large quantity of drugs in my late teens, I knew firsthand the power of opportunity as opposed to the wrath of the criminal justice system. Along the way, with the help of my, and guidance of my district attorney, my supervisor, and judges, I learned the power of the prosecutor to change lives instead of ruining them. And that's how we do it in Boston. We helped a woman who was arrested for stealing groceries to feed her kids get a job. Instead of putting an abused teenager in, in adult jail for punching another teenager, we secured mental health treatment and community supervision. A runaway girl who was arrested for prostituting sur to survive on the streets needed a safe place to live and grow, something we could help her with. I even helped a young man who was so afraid of the older gang kids showing up after school that one morning, instead of a lunchbox into his backpack, he put a loaded 9 millimeter. We would spend our time that we'd normally take prepping our cases for months and months for trial down the road by coming up with real solutions to the problems as they presented. Which is the better way to spend our time? How would you prefer your prosecutors to spend theirs? Why are we spending $80 billion on a prison industry that we know is failing when we could take that money and reallocate it into education, into mental health treatment, into substance abuse treatment, into community investment so we can develop our neighborhoods? So why should this matter to you? Well, one, we're spending a lot of money. Our money. It costs $109,000 in some states to lock up a teenager for a year with a 60% chance that that person will return to the very same system. That is a terrible return on investment. Number two, it's the right thing to do. If prosecutors were a part of creating the problem, it's incumbent on us to cr create a solution, and we can do that using other disciplines that have already done the data and research for us. And number three, your voice and your vote can make that happen. The next time there's a local district attorney's election in your jurisdiction, ask the candidates these questions. One, what are you doing to make me and my neighbors safer? Two, what data are you collecting and what are you training your prosecutors to make sure that it's working? And number three, if it's not working for everybody, what are you doing to fix it? If they can't answer the questions, they shouldn't be doing the job. Each one of you, that raised your hand at the beginning of this talk is a living, breathing example of the power of opportunity, of intervention, of support, and of love. While each of you may have faced your own brand of discipline for whatever malfeasances you committed, barely any of you needed a day in jail to make you the people that you are today some of the greatest minds on the planet. Every day, thousands of times a day, prosecutors around the United States wield power so great that it can bring about catastrophe as quickly as it can bring about opportunity, intervention, support, 
and yes, even love. Those qualities are the, strong, the hallmarks of a strong community, and a strong community is a safe one. If our communities are broken, don't let the lawyers that you elect fix them with outdated, inefficient, expensive methods. Demand more. Vote for the prosecutor that is helping people stay out of jail, not putting them in. Demand better. You deserve it. Your children deserve it. The people who are tied up in the system deserve it. But most of all, the people that we are sworn to protect and do justice for demand it. We must, we must do better. Thank you.
Because you had no idea that these videos even existed. So how and when did you find out? Uh, I was in Las Vegas and it was June 2013 and a, a friend uh, wrote me a text and said, I just want to warn you, someone is sharing links all over your channel, which at the time we had about 50,000 subscribers, mostly young teenage girls. And she said they're sharing links saying that you're a, a whore and a bad role model and uh, these, porn, these porn sites have videos of you. And I had to Google my name and there popped up this video and my heart just sank and my world came crashing down around me. And at this point, you wasn't even with your boyfriend. You'd been... I hadn't been with him for years, for years. It came completely out of nowhere. I'd moved on uh, with my, my beautiful girlfriend and, and we were building a career and a life and he tried to ruin everything. And you couldn't contact him or anything at all? I didn't, I didn't contact him. I hadn't been in touch with him for years because of the difficult breakup. And so I just went right to law enforcement once I got the courage to speak out. Um, this was a British boyfriend, because you're, you're American. Mm -hmm. um, so you have your own YouTube channel. How did this affect what people were saying about you? Because, as I said, you didn't know that these existed. And they were shared. So this is the trouble. Somebody posts it on one site, mm -hmm. but then it's shared. So it was... It was going viral, wasn't it? Absolutely. You know, these videos were viewed tens of thousands of times and on 37 different sites that they got shared to. Our fans were saying, you know, I looked up to you so much. You're such a role model, but I can't support somebody who would do this. Or I looked up to you and, and now I'm not going to watch anymore. We lost so many subscribers. We lost advertising opportunities because we weren't brand friendly. And how did it affect you personally to know that those kind of videos and images of you are out there in the public domain? <sighs> I, I was diagnosed, I mean, I, I became an alcoholic by the time I was 23. I was diagnosed with PTSD. I have night terrors um, and sleep paralysis, so I can't actually wake up from the nightmare sometimes. Still, that's still... Still. Five, ten times a night, Bria has to wake me up. Uh, I have anxiety, depression. Whenever I'm walking about, you know, going to the supermarket, every man that I see, I have to come up with some plan in case he tries to attack me, how I will save myself. Um, and do you, are you thinking, he might have seen that? He might oh, have of seen those, those images of me? Absolutely. You know, I've, I, I'm constantly worried that somebody has seen it. And even sometimes getting out of the shower, looking in the mirror, like seeing my body, it's just, it's very difficult, very triggering, and that's taken years to try to get... And that's so done. difficult, Emma, isn't it? Because it, the, the effects go on and on and on for Chrissy, even though that she, she's won this case yeah. against him, it hasn't stopped, those, those images have been seen now. I mean, there's some validation in knowing that you were the innocent victim there, of course, mm -hmm. but what happened to you is that complete lack of control. Mm -hmm. People do post their own porn, and people are willing to do that, and that's acceptable for those individuals with no shame. But for you, you had your absolute world taken away, your body used by men everywhere, and that capacity of having no control of where those individual frames are and mm -hmm. how far those videos have got is something that you're going to have to live with. At the same time, though, I think it's really important that anybody listening recognises that even if you are a willing participant of uploading or playing around with your own movies at home, the minute you give control to another human being over that footage, you have no control over where that's going to go. So it's really important that if you aren't like Christy and you do engage in those videos with consent, you're very careful about where that material is disseminated or whether you keep control of it. Because the truth is, I've worked with lots and lots and lots of young people and adults who found themselves in very similar situations and actually who haven't had the strength and the real fight in them to go ahead and do what you've done. And what you have managed to do is validate that for anybody out there who has done this, there is now a test in law which says that they can be at least privately prosecuted, if not criminally prosecuted. Yeah, we're saying it's a, it's a, it's a landmark, yeah, landmark case because it's been a very, very long process for you. Um, but at the High Court in London uh, on Wednesday, you won that case and your ex-partner must now pay legal fees and has to destroy any remaining images, because mm. there might be more that you didn't know about, I mm -hmm. presume, and hand over the copyright of those uploaded films. Um, was there a sense of relief, victory, revenge back? You know, I, I think that he lives in his, his own sort of hell and, and hopefully will for the rest of his life. But I, I definitely feel vindication. I feel like my name has been cleared. I got some of my dignity back, but I would describe it as having been imprisoned by this case for years and sort of being unchained from the shackles. You must have oh, yeah, well, felt like giving up. It must have been just absolutely awful. Yeah. I mean, for young children out there, I've got a 
Nina to mm. age and I. What advice or warning would you have for parents out there? Well, one, as parents, parents themselves do things like this. So acknowledge that sexual impulses lead at times to low regulation on your behaviour. So if you have children, the best thing you can do is talk to them. If they are going to engage in relationships, and kids do, that's the truth. We might not like mm. it, but they do engage in sexual behaviours. Make sure that they don't identify themselves in any way, shape and form on those kind of videos and materials. Make sure so don't that show their face. Absolutely no things that actually demonstrate who they are. Secondly, ideally talk to them about the fact that you should only be doing that if you feel like you're in a respectful relationship. Even if you're a young person, it's possible to have respectful, caring relationships with partners. And the most important thing is, if you find out, as I have worked with many young people who have found out that this kind of thing has happened, you have to talk to somebody. Go and speak to your mum and dad, acknowledge that it's yeah, happened. You'd agree we with that, Christine. With it. You'd oh agree if you've been... I desensitize myself to it. I, 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 uh, I don't know. I went to great lengths. He is pure evil, but you'd never know it by looking at him. But when you hear him, that's another story. His killing field was Milwaukee, and he got away with murder for more than a decade. But how could any of this happen? For the first time ever, Nancy Glass is here inside the world of Jeffrey Dahmer. Bill, when I sat down opposite Jeffrey Dahmer for this interview, I wondered what he would tell me, how hard it would be to get him to discuss his horrific crimes. What I found was that he was very forthcoming. He volunteered details that may be difficult to hear. I began by asking what he wanted from the men he picked up. I had uh, these obsessive uh, desires and, and uh, thoughts wanting to control them, to... Uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, possess them permanently. And that's why you killed them? Right. Right. Not because I was angry with them, not because I hated them, but because I wanted to keep them with me. And uh, as my obsession grew, uh, I was saving body parts such as uh, skulls and uh, skeletons. Jeffrey Dahmer is recalling his monstrous past. Almost two years ago in this little apartment in Milwaukee, police discovered the grisly remnants of one of the most horrible crime sprees in American history. Jeffrey Dahmer, an unassuming chocolate factory worker, would eventually confess that he had seduced, murdered, and dismembered 17 young men. He even ate some of his victims' body parts. He instantly became the center of worldwide media attention, a serial killer unmasked. There were protests and press conferences in Milwaukee as people tried to understand how this could have happened in their midst. How did Jeffrey Dahmer get away with murder after murder for 13 years? How did a boy born into a hard-working, middle-class family turn into the worst kind of monster imaginable? In this exclusive interview, we put those questions to Jeffrey Dahmer himself. We met with him at the maximum security prison where he is serving his sentence of 999 years. For the first time, he I, I talks any, about his anyone. crimes and gives us a chilling look inside the mind of a serial killer. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight uh, when you uh, depersonalize another person and view them as just an object, uh, an object for pleasure instead of a, a living, breathing human being. Uh, it... it seems to make it easier to uh, do things you shouldn't do. The reason why Jeffrey Dahmer was able to get away with his crimes was because of just what you are seeing here. Jeffrey Dahmer is intelligent and articulate. That is what makes him so frightening. But if you listen carefully to his words throughout this interview, you realize it is a thin disguise. You do sound, though, like the kind of person who could have said to himself... 
This is wrong. I must stop. I always knew that, that it was wrong, but uh, uh, after the, f the first, the first uh, killing was not planned. I was uh, coming back from the shopping mall back in 78. I had had uh, fantasies about picking up a, a hitchhiker and uh, taking him back to the house and uh, having complete control and dominance over him. The hitchhiker's name was Stephen Hicks. He was just 18. Jeffrey Dahmer took him to his parents' house. There he strangled him with a barbell. He dismembered the body and hid it in a drain pipe. It was Jeffrey Dahmer who gave those details to the police in his confession. No one, no one had a clue as to what was happening for, for over a decade. During that time, Jeffrey Dahmer joined the army and was sent to Germany. He was eventually discharged for a drinking problem and returned to Ohio. Nine years after Stephen Hicks' murder, the killing began again. What happened to you in the nine years in between that you were able to stop, that you were able to control yourself? It just wasn't an opportunity to uh, fully express what I wanted to, to do. There was just not the, op the physical opportunity to do it then. And uh, I started, when I moved to Milwaukee in 81, uh, I started reading pornography, going to the bookstores. Um, eventually that led to uh, frequenting the gay bars. And then I, one time I brought this uh, young man back to the hotel room, the Ambassador Hotel, uh, was just planning on drugging him and uh, spending the night with him. I had no intention of hurting him. When I woke up in the morning, he uh, had a broken rib here. I was heavily bruised. Apparently, I had uh, beaten him to death with my fists. And you have no memory I of it? Have no memory of it. But that's what started the whole spree all over again. Dahmer says he snuck the corpse of his victim, Stephen Toomey, out of his hotel room in a suitcase. Then he took it to his grandmother's house, where he cut up the body and put it in plastic garbage bags. When you killed these men afterwards, were you repulsed? Were you upset? No, it, at the time, uh, it, was, it was almost addictive. It was almost... Uh, a surge of energy. Uh, I wouldn't have to uh, worry about um, any of their needs or anything. I just had complete control of the situation. But Jeffrey Dahmer was out of control. The urge to kill had overpowered him. As police later learned, he wasn't satisfied with his victim's death. He wanted more. Why did you photograph them? It was my way of remembering uh, their appearance, their physical beauty. Uh, I also wanted to keep something. If I couldn't keep them there with me whole, I, at least I felt that I could keep uh, their skeletons. And uh, I even went so far as planning on uh, setting up an altar with uh, the uh, ten different uh, skulls and skeletons. And what was the purpose of the altar going to be? Uh, as a sort of uh, memorial. Uh, a, a point where I could... I don't know. It's, it's, it's so bizarre and strange, it's hard to describe. A place where I could collect my thoughts uh, and feed my obsession. When the bodies were still in your apartment, there was no time when you would see them and say, this is grotesque, what have I done? There were times, there were times, but the compulsive obsession with uh, doing what I was doing overpowered any feelings of revulsion. 
This man, with a quiet, almost shy demeanor, became a master manipulator who was able to lure strangers he met at gay bars to his apartment. He was even able to con the police into returning a 14-year-old boy to him after neighbors called 911 upset that the child was in the street naked and bleeding. Dahmer convinced the police that he and the boy were simply having a lover's quarrel. There's an intoxicated uh, boyfriend of another boyfriend. Well, how old was this child? It wasn't a child, it was an adult. After the police left, Jeffrey Dahmer murdered that boy, Conorak Synthesomphone. This man says he had a near-fatal encounter with Jeffrey Dahmer. He wanted to take some pictures of my back. He hit me with a rubber hammer on my neck. He was lucky to escape because by then the killing had become almost routine. Before you went out to pick up a man, was there any kind of ritual you went through? I'd go to the nightclubs, uh, drink, watch the, uh, the strip tea shows. And uh, if I didn't meet anyone at the bars, I'd uh, go to the bath clubs and uh, meet, meet someone there, offer them money, and we'd go back to the apartment, um, have a few drinks. I'd have the, uh, the uh, sleeping pill mixture already prepared. Person would drink it, fall asleep, and uh, that's when they would be strangled. Watching the movie Exorcist 3 was also part of his ritual. It put him in the mood for murder. I felt so hopelessly uh, evil and perverted that, uh, that I, I actually derived a sort of pleasure from watching that tape. Did you like feeling evil? No. No, I didn't. But uh, I had tried to overcome the thoughts, and it worked for a while, but eventually I gave in. While Jeffrey Dahmer may say things today that make it seem like he understands what went on in his mind, he does not. All he can do is tell you what happened, but he cannot stop whatever it is that drove him to kill in the first place. Do you still feel those same urges? Do you still feel that compulsion, that obsession? Uh, I wish I could say that uh, it just left completely, but uh, no, there are times when I still do, still do have uh, the old compulsions. Jeffrey Dahmer says as time went on, his mind became more and more warped, and yet he was clever enough to continue to elude police and lure young men to his apartment. We should warn you, the details are very graphic. I started having these obsessive thoughts uh, when I was about uh, 15 and 16, and they got worse and worse. What were your fantasies about? Uh, they were sexual fantasies of control, power, uh, complete dominance. Uh, they became reality. Was there pleasure in that fantasy? There was excitement, uh, fear, pleasure all mixed together. Jeffrey Dahmer fulfilled his fantasies by murdering and dismembering 17 young men. In time, his desires became more extreme, his deeds more grotesque. Listen to him talk about the most unnatural things in the most matter of... <laughs> when they die, they all your favorite. Yeah. All belong to you. 
What you're listening to has never been aired before. I see. What you do if I turn with you? And what I could do. They're confession tapes of a man who could be America's worst ever serial killer. A man who may be the worst serial killer in U.S. history. Samuel Little is already behind bars for murder, and now he says he killed around 90 people since the 1970s. For 40 years, he claims to have killed women across the United States, strung on them to death. Oh, God. That was so crazy. I want more. He was arrested close to 100 times, but kept evading justice supposedly due to a lack of sufficient evidence. I try to trace back mm -hmm. to when I became a to open my throat. For weeks, I've been traveling around America to bring you the story of Samuel Little. In this video, you'll hear more of the exclusive recordings of those confession tapes. This is Samuel Little's story in his own words. The life of a serial killer. I'll see you there. James B. with the Texas Rangers interviewing Samuel Little, the Palmdale Prison Unit, California Bureau of Corrections, Thursday, May 17, 2018 at 1021 a.m. When do you think is the first time you had a killing? 1970. 1970. You remember the first one? Yes. Yeah. Cool. And uh, Nick, that was it. She evidently wanted this to happen, you know. So how long after the first one before you did the second one? About a month, too. So you're going pretty quick. Yeah, man. How did you kill her? What happened? Same, same procedure. I kissed her. Yeah, thing I kissed her. You know, I see. What you do if I strangle you? How much I could do? You better really bless the heart. Samuel Little's already been convicted of killing three women, but he claims to have killed at least 90. If that's confirmed, it would make him the most prolific serial killer in US history. In May 2018, in a series of police interviews lasting seven hours, he confessed to murder after murder after murder. The level of detail in his confessions and his descriptions of the victims meant the FBI had to take him seriously. His confessions started to match autopsy records and previously unsolved cases, some of which weren't even identified as homicides in the first place. Did you keep track? I lost track. Yeah. I had a complex case. Do you think there's more out there that you kind of forgot about, or do you think that this is no thing? Is that no? Are any bodies buried anywhere? That didn't waste no time to do the How many people do you think you can draw on their face? I can draw from memory. These are the portraits drawn by Samuel Little himself. They're the women he claims to have killed. They're so accurate that family members have recognized lost loved ones from them. The disappearance of most of these women went unnoticed for years. Samuel Little claims to have killed across 19 states in total. He targeted vulnerable women that no one else was paying attention to, most of whom were prostitutes. How many states, different states have been? Florida, Georgia, come on, we are. East Coast come down, triple mile, in the uh, come down, there's an order to leave on Florida and this trip, and go across, come back up, <laughs> until you get to California. Los Angeles? How many are there? I uh, see you're about 20. I ain't never lost control of it. And I always was very cautious to try to, to keep from getting busted. And uh, I didn't pick on that it would be missed. Prostitutes. Prostitutes. There were no women nurses and civil teachers and all right, that. Right. That's the reason why I didn't get busted long time ago. You like black girls or black girls back? Black. Yeah. yeah I mean, I ain't, I ain't crazy, but I didn't love black girls. There was one major theme that links Samuel Little's murders, and it's how he killed them. He says he was 30 when he first began killing but he traces his obsession with strangulation back to a much earlier age. I never dreamed of not being like this. So why do you think you became what you are? You know what? I try to trace back mm -hmm. to when 
I became attracted to a woman's throat. Right. I remember going to school in Lorraine, but I noticed that when I was in school, four or five years old, the teachers met. She turned, I didn't go crazy on it <laughs> until uh, all of a sudden, yeah. I wanted more. Yeah. And so I asked, I asked the good Lord, I said, boy, man. Do you believe in God? Yes. So do you need to clear your conscience before you go? Or is that a one-way conversation with him? The more you listen to Samuel Little, the more horrific the story becomes. The women he targeted, how he killed them, was the perfect storm that let him hide in the shadows for close to 40 years. Although he's now behind bars, for many of the families, justice came decades too late. See, it's a strange thing about the women. See, see, a lot of them... A lot of these women, they have a death addiction. They want to die? Yeah. If they was alive to this day, they'd be my friends. If they were alive today, those all those girls would be your friends? They, not, they didn't die mad at me. They was my friend. It's Friday night in Midtown Manhattan, and I'm here to hang out with Martin Shkreli, who became famous in October for raising the price of a drug that's used to treat HIV-positive patients by more than 5,000%. The drug in question is called Daraprim. It used to cost $13.50 per pill. Turing changed the cost to a whopping $750. That's price gouging, pure and simple. Martin Shkreli is a 32-year-old entrepreneur and company builder from Sheep's Head Bay, Brooklyn. After increasing the price of Daraprim overnight, he became the poster child for capitalistic greed. Shkreli ran with the bad boy image, flaunting his trollish behavior in the media. He's not your typical pharma tycoon anyway. Over the past year, he's funded an indie record label, claimed he would bail Bobby Shmurda out of jail, and purchased the only copy of a legendary Wu-Tang Clan album, with no immediate plans to play it. In December, Shkreli was indicted on securities fraud charges and is now under investigation by both Congress and the Federal Trade Commission for price gouging.
This is a story I want you to know. There are some things in life you prepare for, and some things that just hit you like a ton of bricks. You have to pull yourself together. For some reason, either no one wants you to feel anything, or they want you to feel everything. Oh, Ava! Ava, I'm so sorry! Are you okay? Hey, why don't you come with me? Hmm? I have a free period. I had been holding in a secret for the past three days, and it was eating at me. But I ended up telling my favorite teacher the whole story, and for the first time in days, I felt relieved. Ava Gutowski, please come to the main office. Ava Gutowski, please come to the main office. I thought I was getting called to the principal's office for running out of class, but what was waiting for me was something entirely different. My secret, that I'd been hiding was about to be revealed to everyone. Is this the boy? Is this the boy who raped you? My teacher had told the office, and the office told the police. I was driven straight to the hospital. I had to strip naked while a nurse photographed me for evidence of bruises. I spent the next three months in and out of therapy sessions and going to the police station after school to get justice for what happened to me. I didn't want any of that though. It was what other people thought I needed, when I kept telling them all I needed was time. The whole time, I was still in school with him, the boy. And I had to walk by him in the halls every single day. And after all the hours of testing and questioning, not one thing came of it. The police dropped my case, and the school didn't help me either. I was forced to handle it on my own. How's it going, sister? Okay. I totally feel you. I feel like every time I buy bananas, they just go bad, and then I have to replace them within a week. Well, you could take those old bananas and make banana bread. It took me one of the worst times of my life to realize life's biggest lesson. Things are going to happen that you don't think you can handle. But in the end, the only person that can get you through something is yourself. I love banana bread. Who doesn't? And it was in that moment that I decided that I would take all the bad bananas in my life and turn them into the best tasting banana bread ever. Oh, schnitzel. For some people, going to court and confronting the man who raped you is difficult, but ultimately empowering. 
For me, I have never felt more ashamed, degraded, and powerless in my life. I pictured this moment differently. I waited three years, 10 months, and one day before I addressed my rapist in court. I thought I would feel stronger or a sense of accomplishment. Instead, I felt like I had barely survived the legal system. I felt even more broken than I already was to begin with. I got justice, but it sure didn't feel that way. I decided to document my experience going through the legal system as a survivor to give a glimpse into what this process is actually like. Capturing the back and forth travel from where I live in New York City to where the assault happened in Los Angeles. Logging video diaries and recording my victim impact statement from inside the courtroom all took place within the last two years of the process. That's why we're here today. Because of what you did almost four years ago, the night you raped me, what I want you to know is how insignificant, less than human, and broken I have felt as a result. For every 1,000 people who are raped in the U.S., only 230 of them report their rape, and fewer than five perpetrators will ever be put behind bars. My rapist was one of them. In 2014, I was a junior in college celebrating the end of final exams. A man who I didn't know drugged me at a local college bar and took me to his apartment. He sexually assaulted me while I was incoherent. And a day later, I found out he had taken videos of what he had done to me while I was unconscious. At first, I barely even realized what had happened. But I knew if he did this to me, it was only a matter of time until he did it again to someone else. I decided to report him to the police. I did it because I couldn't stand the thought of you doing this to another woman and getting away with it. I felt responsible to report my rape. It's not the right decision for everyone, but for me it was. I thought filing a police report, having video evidence, and getting a rape kit done would be enough for people to believe me. It wasn't. A rape kit can provide DNA evidence when a sexual assault has occurred. The process involves standing naked on a piece of butcher paper while nurses collect DNA samples and take pictures of your body, followed by an internal examination with lots of poking, prodding, and swabbing. It's a highly invasive exam that takes hours to complete. As horrible as it was, I had to do it if I wanted any chance of this going to court. I waited six months for my case to even get picked up by the district attorney at the L.A. County Sex Crimes Unit after they decided it was strong enough to hold up in court. And while I'm forever grateful for this, I quickly learned the reality of my situation, that the justice system isn't set up to protect survivors. I became my own advocate. I would have to call to get updates on hearings about my own case, only to be left devastated after being told it was postponed again. I would have to calm myself down after having a private investigator follow me and confront me at my place of work. He came and found me in the newsroom and presented me with papers basically saying that the defendant is asking for my phone records. At one point, I flew myself out to LA to beg a judge to stop granting my perpetrator's wishes to postpone hearings. In the court process, you're assigned someone to help you. They're your DA, a public official who acts as a prosecutor on behalf of the state. But they're overworked and understaffed. I would put all of my faith and trust and questions into this person, and I would finally feel some sense of control or understanding. But I ended up having to work with four different DAs, each time having to rebuild that relationship all over again and come to terms with the fact that yet again another stranger knew these embarrassing facts about me. I don't remember what it's like to be living in a never-ending nightmare. I'm not the same young woman you took advantage of in December 2014. It's confusing to fight to see an end to something like this while dreading it at the same time. As far as you know, it's on. They're selecting the jury tomorrow. Apparently, they didn't have enough jurors to show up today. The idea of going to trial haunted me. Not only did I have to look at the man who took so much life out of me and my family, but I would have to rewatch him doing this through the videos he took. I felt humiliated, angry, and depressed 
about the way I was being portrayed in front of a room of strangers. They look at those videos of me and they're like, you know, are you sure that wasn't consensual? And it's like, why would I be here right now? Why would I be trying so hard? Why would I be like putting up with this for the last four years of my life? Trial ended up being one of the most destructive parts of this entire process. The court didn't allow me to be there for my trial outside of my own testimony, since my presence could potentially influence other witnesses' testimonies. So I got to hear all the details from my family who sat through it all. I had an option to let a court-appointed person go in my place to give my testimony, but I knew the reality. If I wasn't there, it would be used against me. To not show up would discredit my validity as a victim. The purpose for imposing a sentence is to punish conduct. I don't think he's sorry for what he did. I mean, maybe he is. I just don't see that. The jury found him guilty of two felony charges. Two months after, I was given the option to address my rapist. This is called a victim impact statement, similar to what the dozens of women did at the Dr. Nassar sentencing. It's her chance to address the court and address the accused. I can never wish what happened to me upon another person. If I ever have a daughter, will she experience something like this? Will she be unlucky enough to meet someone like you? My rapist was sentenced up to six years in federal prison and will remain on the sex offender registry for the rest of his life. And while my case is seen as a victory in the eyes of our legal system, my story sadly represents a small minority of cases. This is one of the many reasons we do not see other women coming forward. Regardless of all the evidence, court appearances, and having the freaking LA District Attorney's Office on my side, it was still barely enough to put my rapist behind bars. I'm a cisgender white woman who reported my rape, and this is the reality I faced. So what does this mean for the rest of survivors who don't fit my exact profile? To remind you, 78% of rapes are not reported, and women of color who are even more likely to be assaulted are even less likely to report these incidents. And who can blame them? I'm not sharing my story to discourage others to come forward, or to downplay the efforts of those who are fighting for sexual assault survivors. I have immense gratitude for those people who work in these thankless roles and who dedicate their lives to help people like me. The first explosion happened, about 10 or 15 seconds later there was a second explosion. It's a nice moment here at the stadium as we stand united with the people of Boston. It was a feel-good moment at Yankee Stadium as New Yorkers showed their support by singing the theme song of their hated rivals, the Boston Red Sox. But no one was feeling very good as the day started at Boston FBI headquarters in the cart lab where agents had spent the night searching the chilling video for images of the terrorist. Uh, he was, was, was hidden in plain sight. We couldn't see anything that stuck out. You're tearing your hair out? Uh, yes, that would be one good way of describing it, yes, but just frustration. I talked to one of the agents who uh, reviewed the tape, and he said, you have no idea how many times I had to view the tape to get past the horror to see who it would be. That took a long time because you were just gripped by that. This is the man they were looking for but could not spot. It was very frustrating because we, we watched it over and over and over again. Any information that you have, any videos or photographs, could be helpful to this investigation. The clues they're looking for now is, did somebody see a person put a bomb in a trash can, a mailbox, leave us a sack on the sidewalk? Somebody saw something, and that's what they're looking for right now. That's the most important clue that they could have. 
Tuesday, we get a call from the public from a person who said, you know, I was across the street taking pictures of, of my friend running, and, and the pictures were taken just immediately before the explosion, and we think that you might be interested in my photos. And we said, absolutely. That still photo combined with the video put, put the pieces of the puzzle together. FBI bomb technicians had determined where the bomb had detonated, and in that precise spot, they could now see a black backpack right there. That's the first time you saw that's that? That's the first time we saw that bag. We said that's going to be the bomb. And then we start to look around that location, of around the bag, of who could have been responsible or who that bag belonged to. Was it the man in the white hat? That might be our guy. And we went back to the, the video and synced them both up together. That was the aha moment. And, and we grabbed the executive management from the command post and brought him in and said, this is who we're looking for. Now it seems so obvious. You see him walking in about four and a half minutes beforehand. You see him with a backpack. You see him on a phone. You see him get to that point and just gently lead to the side and put the backpack on the ground. And then you fast forward to the moments just before the first blast. And you see everybody react. Well, his reaction was slightly different. It wasn't as panicked. You could tell that he knew that that was about to happen. And then you start to count 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, and he starts to walk out back from the direction he came, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, and you get to 12, and just as he exits the frame, that second blast happens. But there were two bombs and two bombers, and at this point, the FBI only had one bomber identified, the one with the white baseball cap on backwards. Could he have set off both, you think? Um, at that point, we didn't know. So now the FBI team set out to backtrack the bomber in the white hat. Agents later created a mock-up model of the crime scene. This is an actual 3D model of the Boylston Street scene. Marking in yellow, all the surveillance cameras they knew were set up along Boylston Street. And these yellow dots are all cameras. CCTV cameras. So then we started looking backwards, and we play the tape backwards to make sure we see where he comes from. Going backwards, picked up first by the cameras at Walgreens. And we can see him coming from here. Then by the ATM camera at Bank of America, in front of the Back Bay Social Club. The next key piece of CCTV footage we get is here at Whiskey's Restaurant. Where Whitehead is seen with another man wearing a black hat. And it's actually at Whiskey's where we first see them together. And so when you saw them here, then you knew that was the second person. Absolutely. That's where we have now black hat and white hat. That's essentially our second aha moment. Now we're looking for two bombers. Yet it turns out this key video came within minutes of being erased. The system at Whiskey's records over the previous day's images every 24 hours. On the day of the bombing, mm -hmm. cameras are rolling. Huh? Cameras are always rolling. The Whiskey's manager put in an urgent call to Boston police. You know, you need to get here right away because I don't know that it's going to not recycle on top of each other. Detectives raced to the restaurant and got here just in time to unplug the system and preserve this key video. Now, more than 3,000 federal agents and police were in the hunt. The FBI was conducting aerial surveillance on more than a dozen possible suspects in the Boston area. We were desperate. I mean, we were absolutely desperate to figure out who these guys were. The manifest of every international flight were scrubbed. We had no solid indication to say they were still in the area, or even in the country, or, or wherever. Then late on Tuesday, the photos of Black Hat and White Hat were run through the FBI's brand new billion dollar facial recognition software. It didn't get us anywhere, unfortunately. Manufacturers were boasting that the software could be used to match suspects under surveillance with official photos. That did not happen in Boston. Facial recognition software at that time was good to compare driver's license and passport photos to other driver's license and passport photos. It didn't help with the photos and the videos that we had. We do not know whether this is an act of an organization or an individual or individuals. As the FBI has more information, as our counterterrorism teams have more information, uh, we will make sure uh, to keep you and the American people posted. There was pressure, pressure from Washington, D.C., the you know, president's being briefed, you know, FBI headquarters, we're, we're working with them, you know, hourly, and it was this constant check, where are we at, where are we at, where are we at? These people weren't killed in the blast, where are they going to be next? 
That then. was the concern. That was the concern. What's next? Where are they? 